uh, even falling down or sometimes going a little bit astray, you are the one uh, who watch over us with your good shepherd. And we thank you that today we can reflect on that and much more. And so uh, may we lean into uh, your bosom through the Lord Jesus Christ. May the angels gather around us to protect uh, precious knowledge that you want to give to us. And also, uh, even Lord, to just distribute uh, and put into each one of our scrolls of instructions uh, to anoint us for service in growing in you as living stones in the temple here uh, in the gem body and beyond the gem body into the rest of the body of Christ. In the name of Jesus. Amen. All right. So um, John's gospel, one of the most powerful pictures was Jesus saying, I'm the good shepherd. And so, of course, all of us know how uh, in the Old Testament, the most famous passage would be, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And uh, we have not really stopped to think what Jesus was doing. Actually, in John 10, and uh, this is where we find the only place in entire scripture that we have the 66 books where we have the mention of this feast right which is the feast of dedication called hanukkah all right so john 10 22 we are told that jesus was within kind of the temple area and he had just announced that he's a good shepherd and he was saying that all who went before me they were thieves and robbers now the people were getting very uneasy, but uh, we want to focus uh, today on uh, the whole feast of Sukkot. And then in the middle of it, you, you are stuck with the feast of, you can say, this dedication, which is the feast of dedicating the temple. Now, the feast of Sukkot, which is the, the feast of tabernacles, of course, in a large sense, talk about God being with the people. He is the Emmanuel. And uh, the, the people just live within that uh, tent presence of the Lord with the greatest uh, produce of the year being brought into the temple to celebrate, uh, to enjoy, and then to expect a new year. So we know that the Gospel of John is actually structured along feasts, the feast days. Very fascinatingly, the uh, Gospel of John uh, has some of the most incredible, you can say, theological topography around the calendar dates of the Lord. And in from 7 to 10, maybe even to 11, John, uh, we find it's clustered around the Feast of Sukkot, with, which is God living with the people walking among them. And so it's within this context that we see in John 10, Jesus came to say, I'm the good shepherd, right? And uh, so um, and so, the people were troubled and confused. He says, you know, why, you know, we want to know who you really are. So even from chapter 7, as we will notice as we read on, um, the question and many themes keeps coming to the foreground concerning who Jesus is. Are you the Messiah? And uh, so forth and so forth, right? And please tell us, okay, don't trouble us anymore. Don't keep us in suspense. Uh, <laughs> don't poke us in the nose, you know, that kind of a uh, situation. And specifically, we want to draw the relationship between the Feast of Dedication, which is later, right? Several uh, months later from the Feast of Tabernacles, it seems. But actually, they are very closely connected, right? And uh, so we're going to uh, trace that relationship um, historically. And uh, so, um, so, and then along the way, of course, we'll look at these four chapters, and we want to draw our relationship to the Feast of Lights, which is the Feast of Dedication, which is Hanukkah. And uh, we want to recall how about 200 years before the time of Jesus, the one section of the Greek Empire that is settled in Syria, the northern part of 
the land of Israel, they had dominated the land of Palestine. And uh, and then they desecrated the temple and the and Antiochus the third and then the fourth went on to uh, really do it bad. Uh, Antiochus the fourth Epiphanes, uh, Epip- he he is Epiphanes. He calls himself God manifested, right? Antiochus Epiphanes the fourth. So God in the person, and th- and he went to desecrate the Jerusalem temple, and uh, but and he even did all kinds of things, uh, changed the laws. And the greatest thing probably that he did was to forbid the reading and the having of the law, the Torah. So there was destruction going on, forbidding. And he instituted some kinds of crazy things, uh, like uh, even uh, we know during that period, uh, some, uh, unfortunately, some uh, Jewish couples uh, before uh, the bride can be legally married. They have to sleep with a Greek officer. This is terrible, right? So they did everything to destroy the faith of the people and the holiness of their culture. And of course, uh, Antiochus Epiphanes IV, he slaughtered the pig on an altar that was dedicated to Zeus where the uh, altar of the living God was. So all these things were so terrible. So, so when one of the priests from the Maccabees family, the, 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 the main person, the priest who has strong young sons, especially uh, one of the sons, Judas Maccabees, who is called the hammer. Uh, so he resisted uh, making such sacrifices. He killed the, the Roman official. And so there was the war. And as a result of that, through God's help and supernatural empowerment, the Maccabees families who were priests, they were able to harbor uh, what he called organize enough of a powerful force to take back the temple. And then when they took it back, they tore down the altar. They have to rebuild a new altar, obviously, but they also needed the oil. And so the story goes, they found a vase of oil uh, that was sealed with the previous high priest stem that is untempered with. And that oil was able to bring light back to the temple that was cleansed. So you clean out the temple, clean out all the drawers, you wash it down, you remove the altar, and then when everything is ready, you need to light the first lamb. And they were able to uh, work on just one one tiny flask that should last one day, but it lasted eight days. So that was the beginning of the uh, eight-day feast of Hanukkah. All right? So now... Um, the eight-day feast of Hanukkah coincides with the, you can say, eight-day feast of uh, tabernacles, seven days feast of tabernacles, and they add one more day called the day of rejoicing in the Torah, Simchat Torah. So what happened was when the temple was rededicated, immediately they celebrated the Sukkot, even though, you know, taking that back the temple was uh, dated to, and then rededicating was dated to today, 25th of Kislev, which is, or rather, you know, a few days ago. So uh, if you like to explore more, you can go to the end of Book of Haggai, all right? So, so there are different ways of establishing historically why they chose that date to be those dates to celebrate the Feast of Hanukkah. And the Feast of Hanukkah is really, if you time how Jesus was born, really at the time of Tabernacles by reading Luke's account of Zechariah, being of the order of priesthood who served at the temple, and then he was given the announcement of a baby to be born in his old age with Elizabeth. And we can actually work out based on detailed records that exist uh, when Zechariah was serving at the temple, and then we can date when John the Baptist was conceived and born and Jesus six months later. And you actually can have a very precise uh, kind of uh, understanding that Jesus actually was born at the time of tabernacles, Feast of Tabernacles, right? So which means that he was conceived nine months before he was conceived at the time of the Feast of Lights, 
when light came back into the temple at the rededication. So, so you have the eight candles. We have one middle candle as a seven candle to light the eight lights. And uh, interestingly, in the name of Jesus Christ is 888 if you go into the numerology. But uh, so all these point to the fact that if anyone has the right to be in the temple, it's the Son of God, the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the light of the world. John's Gospel actually begins uh, by saying that uh, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was the God, the Word was God. He already makes that point that the Word that was to be born in the flesh is full of grace and truth. Grace upon grace comes out in this person who comes out from the very bosom of the Father. So uh, we know that John's Gospel, of all the four Gospels, is the one that Jesus is very open about who he is. He's the Messiah, and in fact, he's God. And so John, who wrote the record, gave testimony right in the very first verse of that scripture. Now, and we are told that in him was life and his life was the light of the whole world. So remember, the real life of the whole world is because uh, of Jesus as the light that has come into the world. So you can say that everyone who is born in the world uh, is touched by the light or is enabled by the light to burn. Right? We are like a battery unit. Each one of us, <laughs> we are burning with energy, with ideas, uh, burning with all kinds of um, abilities and etc. Right, so you can say that we are all connected to the Lord Jesus in a special way. Now, I wanted to show us this uh, particular layout of the temple to uh, give a better sense of uh, how we are um, how we are learning Jesus and focusing on Jesus through um, what we call. Uh, through the activities that he displays for us in and around the temple. So in this particular layout here, you see the court of women, right? And uh, you see these steps leading up where the, the priestly, Levitical priests, you know, the singers and choirs, they will stand here and sing. Um, and then this is the altar of sacrifice, all right? And then you go in to the holy place and the holy of holies, all right? So um, so this gives you a, a visual picture. And then the court of Gentiles is separated by, is kind of uh, segmented out so they can't get near. So all these places around here is the court of Israel. The women have to be a bit further away. The men can get inside here. And then only the priests can get inside here. And you see some of these uh, places here. Uh, within this kind of a uh, women's court area, which is raised above this area. So you see here, uh, the temple treasury is located somewhere here. And then uh, the this is the triumphant entry area where Jesus uh, came, was ushered in, right? <laughs> and uh, uh, supposedly, and then the women court in sense probably might be located here. And then outside in the what he called the court of the Gentiles. You have the Pharisee and the publican, the parable that Jesus gave. Uh, and then uh, we have Jesus cleansing the temple also outside here. Okay, let's go to another picture. This is done by uh, um, this wonderful uh, kind of a architect, archaeologist, designer, and he has this book here. So it's Lean Wright Meyer. But I've I've researched and populated um, his picture with explanations of each one of these you see. So this is another picture, the Eastern Gate, fascinating Eastern Gate. Right now it's sealed, sealed by the, you know, um, Suleiman and, and the Ottoman Empire. They, they sealed it up because they didn't want, supposedly the Messiah Israel will come in there, but he already went in. So, and then uh, the Muslim, uh, after that, in the Ottoman Empire, they they located a lot of the cemetery right in front here, so as to prevent Elijah from uh, uh, 
coming back and uh, leading, of course, the, uh, the, uh, the Lord God, right? It's coming back, the Messiah. So, so they line up this whole place with the Muslim cemetery. Now across, if you, if you go from the east and towards the Mount of Olives, on the Mount of Olives sites, you have all the Jewish tombs, the Jewish grave sites, and they cost a lot of money. I think you may, if you can get one for a million US dollars right now, you are very, very fortunate because they're very expensive because that's the expectation. So this is how it looks like. So you go in, and you go in through the Nicanor Gate. This may be perhaps the gate called Beautiful, where um, Peter had this man leaping and jumping and walking and praising God in the book of Acts. And then uh, you go inside here, there's probably a place where um, where the priest keeps their garments and across it is where the, 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 the priest prepares the daily uh, sacrifices. All right, so, so, and then the place of slaughtering, this is the altar. And then the laver, you wash yourself. Every time a priest that can go inside the holy place, he has to wash himself, then he goes in. Now, not raised around this, of course, are these uh, both chambers that house different things. And here's the women's court looking down into this place uh, and all the activities that we said measure here. And the treasury, there are 13 trumpet-like objects and for different kinds of offerings or leftover offerings or free will offerings or compulsory offerings, they are deposited in along these walls. There are trumpet-like figures. Okay, so there are six chambers here that um, I've sent you the PDF so you can look uh, into uh, them as you want. So Chamber of Houston, for example, uh, it is here where the Sanhedrin may be meeting, right? And then the Chamber of Oil and Wine is here, okay, where some cooking, uh, et cetera, can be done. And of course, you store your precious store of oil and wine that is used ceremonially. And then the Chamber of the Nazarites right here. So um, we know in uh, Numbers chapter six, right, the Nazarite who keeps a vow have to cut his hair uh, or keep his hair and, until the time is cut. So it's all done here, right? So, and on the right side, you can see on the northern side of it, Chamber of the Heart. I find this very interesting. This is the only place that has air conditioning or rather <laughs> uh, heat conditioning. So it's kept the war warmth because this is where uh, the sleeping quarters are of the priesthood, right? The Kohenim is the Hebrew word for priests, all right? And then very interesting, un, un, interestingly, under this hearth, uh, there is a spiraling staircase. Remember, Jerusalem and the city is, is on a huge rock outcrop, and there are a lot of tunnels, right? And, and you go underground and you find different things, including the Gihon Spring and so forth, and uh, the Siloam. So, so there's a staircase that leads and with illumination from that tunnel to, so that they can reach an underground place where they can wash up the a mikvah. And chamber of lepers, I find this very fascinating as well, because we are told in Leviticus chapter uh, 13, 14, 15, uh, 14, how a person with skin disease cannot come to the temple, but once they are clear, they can be seen by the priest, and then the priest say, okay, go away for another seven days and come back later. Seven days done, and you are still clear, then you can be readmitted. All right? So this is where uh, it all happens. So it still happens until the time of uh, Jesus. And then chamber of, of wood, where the priest sorted the wood for sacrifices, etc right here right and so some fascinating look and it's good to kind of uh, have an idea that this is not uh, uh, sometimes because we we are not historically aware even of the topography of the whole land or especially of jerusalem uh, we'll miss our important biblical instruction or we will tend to spiritualize everything and even the passages that are speaking directly to the 
place or the stations or to certain ceremonies or you know certain words are very very direct we tend to spiritualize them away into some some ethereal some some a happy truth that christians are very happy about and that's where we get a lot of our bible wrong pay attention and as the lord opens our understanding each one of these places remember moses when he was taken up uh well he was taken up in heaven to see a, a kind of a simple blueprint of what he has to reproduce on earth so he did only a simple thing right obviously in heaven is not as simple as the tabernacle in the wilderness but the major areas and components had to be represented so and over time of course uh they came into the land and david he was given knowledge we are told he's given knowledge of further details so uh, the first temple of solomon not only was supplied by david's entire life savings but also plans, right? And then, uh, of course, King Herod, when he became king, he he came to the place where he was pouring a lot of resource into the temple to build it up the way it was during the time of Jesus. And even when Jesus was crucified, it was another 20 years that the renovation was taking place. So in all, uh, the, the the project, the second temple, this is called the second temple, Herod's temple project, took over, you know, 50 years, 50 to 60 years. Enormous amount of energy and funds were thrown into it. Um, so, so this is kind of the background or, or the layout of the temple. And... By the time of Jesus, when he comes here around, and in John chapter 7, we are entering into the greatest feast of the year. The brothers of Jesus were wanting him to go to Jerusalem to show himself uh, because they didn't believe in Jesus. So even Jesus' identity as the Messiah of Israel was doubted by his own brothers. And this happens throughout the Old Testament, Prophets who are prophets of the Lord, their identity were doubted. And this happened all the way down to this day. Uh, some of the uh, real prophets of the Lord are shunned or not known by people around the world, right? But they are the ones who really uh, have uh, have all the, what do you call, terms of covenant faithfulness. And today we're going to explore... Uh, four of these elements in which we should be a part of to make us covenantally true and faithful to be the light of the world the light set on the top of a mountain that is not hidden and we have a relationship to the light remember when we look at the theme and the metaphor of light we are taken right back into the very first opening words of the bible let there be light and the spirit is involved, sitting over the face of the deep, over deep darkness. And then we know by the spirit or by the word, that's the word ruach, the breath of God. By the spirit of God, the word of God. And that's why John 1 links to Genesis 1. And there was creation. And first you see light. So remember, the beginning of life for us is really the life of Jesus. So this life that is in Jesus becomes the light that is to light up everyone in the world, light up you. And so what we are really considering when we come to Hanukkah and looking at the lights that lighted up the temple and the lights that brings the rededication of the temple into being is that now this temple really has the life of God, the life of God and the family of God. So... Um, so this is what we are encountering here. And so at this greatest of feasts, it is God as the fatherhead, along with his family together now celebrating the greatest celebration of the, the whole year, of the whole life, uh, in which uh, God can walk confidently, freely, without being defiled in the midst of the people. 
And oh, just give me a second. I have to let this. Uh, oh, uh, Vivian, can you help come up and get Toby set up? Thank you. All right. Um, so, um, okay. <laughs> Is, is Vivian going to be able to do so or not? If not, um, okay. Uh, um, just give me a second. Oh, okay. All right, so Jesus had this identity crisis that we can see right here. Even as uh, the feast was going on, you know, the people were questioning um, who this person is, not only his own brothers, right in his own family in Galilee. And they they not only not believe in him, they actually wanted him to die, right? And so that's a very real kind of a, a darkness in the soul, even of the family of God, reaching back into the Old Testament. There were people in the family of God all throughout the ages, who want other members of the family uh, to either die physically, in this case, like in John 7, or just to uh, die uh, in shame or lost their ministry or, or, you know, or their privilege to be a member of God's household. So this is very real. This is kind of darkness. Today we are facing a lot of darkness everywhere. And most people don't realize how dark it is un unless you're willing to really open your ears and your eyes not to just stay on the main uh, stream news. There are many, many thousands and thousands of voices, or actually millions, and even of credible people who are being totally shut out from the mainstream media because they are not liked. They are speaking a different word. They are asking for opening up things to be discussed openly concerning right now, vaccines, viruses, and mandates. So anyone who did not fit the mainstream media narrative that is pushing the governments of the world right now, you are being silenced, you lose your job, you lose your livelihood, you are not even treated at the hospital. If you are treated at the hospital in some places, you are treated terribly. These are real things happening. The people who are injured because of the vaccines, they are not compensated, they are piling up their debts because they have to take care of it. So every day I listen to many sad stories and pray with them and, and, and seek the Lord. What can and how can we as a Christian family do? We do what we can. We reach out what we can. But we need to be aware there's darkness because the whole world is only a true brotherhood if you do what I tell you. I'm the boss. Right, and uh, and and every every opposition uh, is, or every question to what I mandate is not tolerated. So this is how it is. There's a lack of the desire to know uh, the light, the true life. But Jesus here on this last day, he's calling the people out. Now, picture it like this: towards the night. We don't know whether it's the day or night when Jesus came. So, so from 6 p.m., you know, it gets dark and then it gets uh, bright at 6 a.m. But at night, Jerusalem, at the time of the Feast of Tabernacles, what we are told from uh, the records is there are four huge, what we call uh, here, there are four huge pit posts, and on top of it, uh, there are these containers that of oil and that the the priests the priests undergarment become the weak right the use undergarment i don't know why they do it like this <laughs> they become the weak and they burn with such brightness that the whole area and all of jerusalem we are told is lighted up right of course we don't expect it to be that but it means it's so bright that everything is exposed to the light so this is happening at the feast of tabernacles so people will be seeing uh, even the evening sacrifices as well, or the morning sacrifices. 
And so, and especially at night, when you're still around that area, it is spectacular. So anyone would be drawn to that sight, be drawn to that light. And that's the picture here. And But here we see Jesus in the last and greatest day of the festival of Sukkot, Tabernacles, shouting and say, those who are thirsty, come to me and drink. So this light that is Jesus, the life of Jesus, is the light of men, and it's the light of every Christian believer must continue to draw us. Despite all the confusion around who Jesus is, who a real Christian is right now. Right now, God is unveiling all the hearts of everyone. There are many who are non-Christians, but who actually show the heart of God much more than perhaps Christian traditions who ignore all the Christ and who, who are just pushing ahead, doing church programs, church activities, uh, being happy about fellowshipping together and ignorant and ignoring cries of so many millions around the world. So we are to come to the true light and to be the bearer of the true light. And so Jesus has come and drink. So this is a time of coming to drink of Jesus. And what does it mean? Well, you go back to chapter four, Jesus told the Samaritan women at the well, I know all about you. So, okay, uh, you know, uh, you had had five husbands and you're living with someone that you're not even married to. Well, that's not the point, right? So if you're one to thirst no more, you want water that springs up in, inside you as life. You, if, basically, Jesus, if you want my life, which is the light of all men, you got to come and listen to me and start drinking whatever that I'm going to let you drink. So in John's gospel, water uh, and drinking, they have to do with the teaching of the Lord Jesus. So you have to drink of me and feed on me, Jesus says in John chapter 6. So here we establish uh, the role of uh, the journey. Always, the journey always must have uh, this drinking of this water, which is drinking of the word of God, which is the spirit of God in whatever the mystical uh, way we can imagine. Foundationally, if you and I if we have a drinking relationship, a real drinking relationship with the Word of God, right? We have the Spirit of God, and we have more and more of the Spirit of God. Now, sometimes, uh, as in the day of Pentecost, right, there is tongues of fire that can come down on you, and you can speak in known tongues, confirming the Word of God, or sometimes you can speak in unknown tongues when you, when, when you pray, or you can prophesy. Okay, these are additional things, but the essential thing is, do you have the word of God? So rather than pray in tongues for five hours, three hours, two hours, pray, Paul says, with understanding and learn and pray at the same time reading the words of God because this would, um, uh, would bring you into these scriptures here. And that's why I do not uh, go with teachers who emphasize on praying in tongues. Uh, just as a form of spiritual exercise to get you uh, higher and deeper, so-called, into the mysteries of God. Um, maybe there is a path there, maybe, but who knows, right? Because we know that people who may uh, do that may be very poor with the real pure water of the Word of God. And they may see all kinds of visions or all kinds of supernatural experiences that don't confirm whether they are helpful or harmful to themselves or to others. So uh, so we want to stay with apostolic faith, which is apostolic teaching, and which began with Jesus, the first apostle of the new covenant. All right, so we want to, uh, at, this, at this feast of light, Hanukkah 2021, return back to a foundation that the Lord has been laying over and over again, but now with the understanding that uh, this is also the birth, the seeding of Jesus at the Feast of Hanukkah wants to bring us to completion at the Feast of Tabernacles. And that's why, as I said, when the temple was rededicated back by the Maccabean uh, priesthood, immediately they 
celebrate ahead of the time the feast of tabernacles which already passed for them right now we go into chapter 8 here um, uh, you know of the first part of it we find the women who was um, caught in sin uh, some some people will say the sinful woman I like the description the woman caught in sin because we can say the sinful men and every one of us right so so the way that we use language can uh, shape the way that we think as sons of God we want to think and we want to speak with precision and so we can get better and better and better at it when we begin to reflect everything that we say Jesus says be careful with every word that you say because you will be held into account so as sons of God as disciples of Christ that's one of the things so the women caught in the act of sin all right or sinning you can say all right so but and then he moves on right so all the people departed they never threw a stone at her and Jesus said neither do I so go and sin no more so Jesus is very forgiving as we have learned over and over again um, Jesus is not like us sometimes our attitudes are rather condemning we look down on people who are struggling with some sin or other or who have fallen but these same people may be much more twice as charitable than than this self-righteous person who does very good very little self-righteous deed except to uh, gloat in the fact that I'm more successful in running my life than you guys and that's another uh, huge uh, blinding kind of uh, deception and that's why Jesus gave the parable of the two servants one owing, owing 10,000 talents so the more privileged you and I are the more gifted we are the more we owe a debt to God so I warned my apostolic friends that look because you are given so much gifts and talents you are like that ungrateful unforgiving servant if you don't become so much more generous in accepting everyone right uh, so so this is a very important reminder for us anyway John 8 Jesus goes on to say I'm the light of the world whoever follows me will never walk in darkness but will have the light of life so at this feast right now of the feast of lights uh, we thank God and we must make sure that we have a knowing relationship with God where we have a clear direction right we won't get lost you know if you are a Christian and you you claim to be a very good Christian or a very passionate one and you're always lost you're always feeling lost you're always feeling whatever then it's time to get back to the instruction of Jesus it's time to get back into the life of Jesus a life that fears nothing except missing on the plan and purpose of God the will of God so we have a sense of direction and in fact previous chapter John 7 now these chapters a lot of the themes interplanetary Jesus was telling those people who couldn't figure out who he is he said if you want to figure out who I am and whether what I'm teaching is from God then you have to purpose or you have to will to do the will of God right so there's a sense of clear direction because you know what the will of God is you're familiar with all the instructions or at least the main ones throughout the Bible and you know that the will of God is on this land on the earth he loves righteousness justice steadfast family love mercy and that's wrapped up in his name too so you can't say that I'm lost in life how can you be lost when you can act righteously when you can judge with good judgment because you know the word of the Lord and when you can act mercifully even to the ones who are hurting you and you can act with great charity and love all the time whether you have plenty or not so plenty you can do that as a principle so these are things that seals our knowing relationship 
with God. So remember, Jesus spoke this, especially in the temple where the offerings were put. So close by, you saw the offering chairs, close by is where the chamber of those who think they know it all is, the Sanhedrin. Right? They think they know it all. And they make all the decisions for the temple and beyond the temple into the larger vicinity of Jerusalem and its city and also to all the, what do you call it? the promised land, all of Israel, and even beyond into the Jews in living outside in diaspora. They were dispersed to the nations. So the powerhouse of the of driving the, the knowledge, you can say, of the people was located on the one hand in the temple within the this 70 elders chosen to represent the leadership of that nation. But you see, it's a corrupt leadership. They don't really know what they're doing. And that's why again and again, we see it from chapter seven all the way down even to chapter 11 and, and beyond. And all the way, they were troubled by the identity of Jesus, troubled by his influence, troubled by his knowledge, or troubled by what he said. And who was troubled? Starting with the highest of that chain. And we are told in chapter 11, Caiaphas said, you guys don't know anything. Because why? Because Lazarus was raised from the dead and people were flocking to Jesus. And Caiaphas said, look, you guys don't know nothing. Now, Caiaphas was not the high priest. He's, he's the past generation. But he never leaves his <laughs> powerful hand, right? So old leaders, sometimes old political leaders. So Annas uh, was uh, the son-in-law, he was the high priest, and but this ex-high priest still reaching deep and controlling things. And you can see that also in the world. People don't want to give up their power. Right now, uh, in the world, a lot of old people are making that decision for a lot of young people, including uh, very young people, even babies. They're making decisions but are they always the right decisions? Do they have the knowledge of God? So we have to understand. Right? So it happened also there. Now, um, they were challenging Jesus, of course, and uh, maybe I will, I'll wrap it up in chapter 10 more detailedly. But here we have this picture. Uh, if you are really uh, having and walking and being the light, you know you have clear direction, you can make true judgment, and you can give a true testimony. So the Christian testimony is not, oh, I go and witness to somebody about Jesus Christ. Well, that's a component, that's an outworking of that testimony. A Christian testimony is to be who you know who you are. So you are a son of God. And all the things in my life are entrusted by God. All my talents I owe God for. And I'm to use them for his glory, for his purposes, to do the good works. Jesus says, why are you trying to kill me, right, in John 10, for all the good works I've done? Right, we're going to come to that. Okay, let's go to um, the third passage in John 9. John 9, it happens right at the steps, just leading into the, the enclosed temples. And this person who was blind from birth. And so the question was, who has sinned? Who has shut out the light of his eyes because he was born from birth? And Jesus gave a very important and powerful reminder that it is for the glory of God. So when we go through darkness, sometimes even without any choice like this man, you know, instead of uh, immediately getting angry or asking why, 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 go to John 9 and says, well, whatever it is, it can be for the glory of God. And of course, Jesus was emphasizing, well, I'm in the world. Uh, he is really being localizing himself within the world that he was in, all right? And so, and he's wanting his family of Jews, the Jewish nation to understand that he is that light. He is that light that started off the whole first creation. 
All right? So I'm right now in the midst of you, the world that belongs to God. Every one of you are children of, children of God. Everyone of you confessing uh, that it is God who created you. You are people specially made by God, and I'm right there. And you know what? You who believe and have professed that he has pronounced light, you are called to be that light that shines out. But I am that. I'm the one who created light. I'm the one that gives first the existence, the meaning, and the purpose, the function of light. So I am that. Do you recognize me? So in, in that confession, Jesus is actually saying that he's the creator. He's the creator. When he says he's the light of the world, he is actually stating that he is the very life and light, the very word of God. Okay, so very interestingly, Jesus spit on the ground, made some mud with his saliva and applied it on the man's eyes. And then he said, wash in the pool of Siloam or Shiloah, right? Shiloah or Siloam, Greek or Hebrew. And then this word means scent. Now we have been considering the word scent, right, in our last meditation. So the father sent the son to this earth and then the son sends the disciples into the cities of israel into every town and the son also sends this blind man blind from birth to the pool called sent so um, he washed and came home seeing so you can say from here that we can learn that uh, being the light of the world being part of that temple that is dedicated to the Lord, being living stones. We have a commission. We can carry uh, responsibility. Uh, and even though that responsibility seems to uh, be carried in the midst of our handicap, or uh, in the midst of our not even seeing perfectly or clearly or yet, we just obey. We just listen and we obey. So we are worthy of being sent. And then what happens? Because of that, there is a, a what do you call, um, there, there is an elevation of our ability to see more and more, clearer and clearer and clearer. So Jesus, at another moment, uh, healed someone first time and then second time. So there's a process to see clearer and clearer and clearer so but we've got to be come to the place where jesus words mean something to us so that at his word we will go right at his word we will go so even to the place of siloan the place where the tower fell right in luke 13 these uh, who were present came to jesus to tell about how the Galileans, Galileans who were bringing sacrifices to the altar were killed and their blood was mingled with the blood of the sacrifices. And, and Jesus asked them the question, do you think these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered this fate? No. You too must repent or you also will perish. What did Jesus mean? It means that the Galileans, they were fighters. They were always rebelling and fighting. And if they just thought that they can fight off evil physically, fight off Rome physically, they are going to end up dead, just like these ones. All right, so they have to change their mind. Wrong strategy. Uh, unfortunately, a part of Christian eschatology that talks about the future is of coming of Christ and the nations of the world, two thirds will be destroyed, plays into this idea that if you can raise an army physically strong enough, then you can kill off uh, the bad side. And that's what the Qumran community, the uh, the, uh, the zealots in a time just after Jesus, and when they banded together, they thought they can fight off Rome. And you know what? Every last holdout, including uh, the last one that held out until about 74 AD at uh, uh, Masada, they were killed. Right. Every single one were killed. So, uh, so that's why uh, one of the reasons why the futurist eschatology, which is the most popular one in the church, 
um, uh, has some big holes and problems with that because you are thinking of a physical battle, whereas it's always been, once the new covenant started, always been a an overcoming of the soul, even though you die as martyrs, even though you don't win the physical battle. And that's why in chapter 6 of Revelation, the souls under the altar were crying out, how soon would you avenge our blood, Lord? He says, okay, just a bit more until the numbers of those who are to be martyred in that generation were complete. And they're going to be killed. But then they are the very ones in Revelation 20, they were told, ruling and reigning with Christ in that thousand years, which is a picture of that period of the last generation of Israel in the first covenant. All right, those who were overcomers in that generation were the, the very first resurrection to come and judge the land when the judgment was poured out upon the land um, in the day of the Lord, uh, Revelation chapter 1, right? John saw in the day of the Lord, so in the day when God was judging that period of time, what was happening. Okay, so, um, so this here reminds us of uh, Shiloh being the first prophetic word that comes out is being given by uh, Jacob in Genesis 49 to his son Judah. The scepter will not depart from Judah. And so guess who is in Judea? Guess who is at the temple in Judah? The Lord Jesus who's of the tribe of Judah, the lion of the tribe of Judah, right? So his authority and he has now come to fulfill this scripture. So chapter 9 of John actually uh, is Jesus' way of asserting his seal that I am that Shiloh, right? I am that Siloa. I am that to whom tribute, obedience, allegiance, royalty must be given. So the word Shiloh sometimes is translated as uh, to whom the one who is to be given the tribute. Right, so Shiloh, Shiloh, or Shiloh, or Shiloh. So that's why you see here in Isaiah 8, 6, again here, in uh, Brother Han covered this uh, recently. All right, so we know the conflicts among brothers between uh, Judah and Israel and then Syria and then meshed up with Egypt and Assyria and how um, God is not pleased that even the king of Judah does not want to trust in the stream that was flowing within the city, a gentle stream, because God's presence is right there. So the very underground stream that flows in the city that, that gives them water um, and that, you know, all the way from the Gihon Spring that comes in, instead of trusting that God is there with them, they rather trust some big power and God said, okay, if you tr just trust your human alliances and then you think you can fight off one big power or the other big power and so forth, you are wrong. And you ignore this silua, Shiloh. The real authority is God in your midst, Emmanuel. Then you know what? I'm going to bring the mighty river Euphrates with the Assyrian army and they'll come and they'll overflow its banks and they will flood out and destroy all of you. And that's what happened, right? So because God is in that gentle stream with the people to assure them, God is with you and me. Right now, you, you find your life very hemmed in, especially those of us who are unvexed, we can't go a lot of places, but <laughs> Shiloh, God is with us, right? So. But you see, God is also with the mighty Euphrates. He can, he, his presence can push the foreign armies, the most powerful forces to come and judge the people who are unfaithful. So God is Emmanuel everywhere. So that's why you, you see in Isaiah 8 uh, here, he says that, look, these people rejected the gentle flowing waters of Shiloh and rejoices over uh, resin and the son of Ramallah, these kings around him. Therefore, the Lord is about to bring against them the mighty floodwaters of the Euphrates, 
the king of Assyria with all his pomp. The Euphrates will overflow all its channels, run over all its banks, sweep on into Judah, swelling away, passing through it, and reaching up to the neck. Its outstretched wings will cover the breath of your land. Emmanuel, God with us. All right. Let's go to the fourth point here is, is the light to ascend. Now, this one takes a little bit more uh, explication. And let me explain why I, I choose to say it's a light to ascend. It's to climb up. John 10, verse 1. Amen, amen, I tell you, whoever does not enter the ship by the gate, but ascends. Okay, this is the word in the Greek. All right, a sense in some other way is a thief and a robber. Okay, so in verse 8, all who came before me were thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. What is Jesus speaking? Jesus is speaking to his historical audience in the historical situation. He's saying that I'm the good shepherd. I'm actually your God. So if you go to Ezekiel 34, he's, God says that I'm the shepherd of Israel and you guys, the leaders, the under shepherds, you are false shepherds and you allow the people to be scattered and to be stolen from, etc. And they are lost everywhere. I myself will seek them out. And that's why Jesus quotes, right? Uh, or uses that phrase to tell the disciples, you go out and you seek the lost sheep of Israel. And he told the Syrophoenician women, you know, the bread is not for you guys. You know, it's for my own children, the lost sheep of Israel. So Jesus knew who he was, of course, and he's very clear about it. And he's announcing in John 10. And later on, he goes to say that what the fathers has given to me, no one can pluck them out of my hand. And my father and I are one. And at this, the Jews wanted to they take up stone to stone him. He says, Jesus says, why do you want to do that? Is it for any of the good works that I've done? And they said, no, 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 no. Not for the good works you've done, but for this one. You claim, you are a man, you claim to be God. You claim to be our God? You claim to be our God. That's why we're going to kill you. Right? So, the Jews there understood what Jesus was communicating. He was communicating the fact that he's the true shepherd of Israel. And so we know that uh, in the Old Testament times, until the time of Jesus, uh, kings, whether it's Nebuchadnezzar or Pharaoh or whatever, they are known as shepherds. And of course, um, you know, in Israel too. So we have references of that. And of course, God himself identifies himself as the shepherd of Israel. So when Jesus uh, announced it, so in, in all of John chapter 10, he was really speaking to that generation of the Jews gathered around him and the disciples. And he's saying all that came before me were thieves and robbers. So who was Jesus referring to? Now remember, he is referring to a number of individuals. First layer, you can say most immediate it's the high priests, the priestly class, the aristocratic who were ruling over the people. They were using their self-knowledge and self-promoted knowledge, and they were not taking care of the people. And so when Rome wants to come and take away, they, they will try to work with Rome in some way, and uh, uh, they, they don't really care for uh, the people in the sense of, and we see that also, you know, how series of kings and, and uh, the priest, uh, priestly kings of Israel just before Jesus, they cooperated with different powers that be just to gain their own safety or their own, uh, uh, what do you call, position of privilege, all right? And they don't mind killing off their own brother, their own family members. And that happens a lot, even in the Herodian family. He kills off his own children as well, besides the few hundred children that he killed along with the, uh, the time of uh, Jesus' birth. So, so it's only for their self-interest. Now today, who are the real shepherds in the world? We look at all the leaders, the heads of states, and look at um, all the uh, ministries, 
organizations, head of organizations, all the ministers, all the senior pastors, all those who, who have influence over a lot of people, the, the, the charismatic teachers and, and the like. So who are the real shepherds? Jesus says, the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He doesn't run away in the face of trouble. So the good shepherd is the one who really uh, is the one who has ascended to the place with God. All right. Um, not those who have tried to ascend through devious means. Whoever does not enter by the gate, you can only ascend through the light. You can only ascend into God, into the kingdom of God, greatness in the light of Jesus' teaching. You want to be great in the kingdom of God? Be a servant of all. You can't use another knowledge and try to climb over, oh, uh, I, you know, I, I know the Bible better, or I can perform signs and wonders uh, better than others. So surely, you know, I, I can come into that place of the heavenly Jerusalem and shine with great glory. No. You got to be like Zacchaeus. You got to be like the women of Luke seven, and you know all these poor and broken people who are willing to be moved by the word, and who are willing to come to the word himself, come to the real life himself, and feed on him, and trust in him, and depend on him, and listen to him, and obey him. It's a conscious decision. You can't be like the Hasmoneans. The Hasmoneans uh, arose with the taking back of the temple in 170, one, was it 164? Yeah, BC, right? When it was taken back, who to now lead Israel? So now the family of priests begin to take over the kingship. So the Hasmonean Empire from that time began to be ruled or rule Israel, not through the legitimate line of King David, right? So the line of King David was not ruling. In fact, for even the period before, we don't see evidence that they were ruling much, even though the line is preserved. But we know that by the time of the Hasmoneans, uh, with the Maccabean family, the priestly family. Now the priesthood became the king. So they are trying to fulfill Zechariah chapter 6, you know, joining the priesthood and the kingship through their own way. Well, God allowed that for a season, maybe even for a purpose, because the whole land was in darkness, was in a mess, and we, we see how temple sacrifices were not perfect, how priestly knowledge was lost. That's in Book of Malachi. And so God allowed that. So, of course, you can have your own government. You can you can have whatever. All right, so, so it was not the legitimate line that ascended to the throne. And then later on, um, this family of priests began to fight once another. So... Uh, they begin to invite Rome in. And so by around 17 BC, when Rome came in to help one of the brothers against the other priestly king brother, Rome just came in to stay, right? And, uh, and then Rome found a very capable administrator who is not even Jewish, but a convert to Judaism. So Antipater, and then with the son, Herod the Great, right? Who succeeded him. And so that's when Rome gave the power of the kingship or the client kingship, the client kingship to um, the family of Herod. And so now it's not the priests who are the kings anymore. Of course, the priesthood is still preserved somehow, right? But the kingship went to the Herodian family. And so um, even before Jesus had a chance to grow up. He had to run for his life from Herod the Great, who was appointed king over the land. And when he died, his land was split into three, under his three sons. And the Herodian Empire went all the way until the 60s when finally it was crushed. And so everybody ran for their lives, right? So, so Jesus uh, said, go and tell that fox, that is Herod, Antipas, the son of Herod the Great, right? So 
So a prophet has to die in Jerusalem. So Jesus, look at these ones, the, the, the kings and the priests as the thieves and the robbers who came before him, who have ascended as though they could climb over into the courtyard of the Lord and into the very holy place and holy of holies and, and establish the, the ark of the covenant, the truth of the covenant by their own self. You can't really be a shepherd. You can't really be like God or ascend to God until you're willing to, to give your life as a light to the world. And that's what the Feast of Dedication today reminds us as well. Now, it's a feast is a feast where Jesus was in the midst of it, we are told. He came into that place and he gave this revelation of who he is. He is the real light of the world. He is the real light whose life lights the world and lights every person who comes into the world. And he is uh, the one who can uh, bring us and show us and grow us and feed us and protect us and bring us into all the things that he has purposed as we uh, discovered earlier on how we're brought into union as disciples as his own sheep he knows every sheep by name he knows your name and he knows your name and you know him his voice you will listen and to no one else in other words anyone who carries a strange voice strange teaching strange fantasies strange exaggerations speculations you don't listen to you and i we listen to him alone all right let us pray our father in heaven thank you again allowing us to go through uh, in a greater depth and i pray that uh, every thing that we have uh, learned together would uh, become uh, something uh, that is real in each one of our lives as disciples of Jesus. Lord Jesus, yes, we want to walk with you into the temple courtyards and into the different areas uh, of the, the courts in, near the treasury or, or under the colonnade of Solomon. Lord, we want to be there uh, with you and understand uh, every bit of uh, you and to be like you as the light as the life of that temple of course we are talking about we want to be the living stones like peter talks about wherever we are positioned right now and right now we are placed in difficult dif different physical places some just a few miles apart and some by thousands of miles but lord we believe and we trust that the power of your life will work in us and through us as the light of the world we are the light of the world you say set on a hill that should not be covered and should not be hidden and so let this light continue to shine the light of uh, seeking you just like seeking with the thirst for living water instruction the light of uh, knowing you so that we uh, are known by you and by the Father. And so we uh, can have clear direction and clear judgments, Lord. Uh, and really, uh, we can bring you honor and glory uh, because uh, of this real knowledge. And Lord, yes, uh, we, want, we want this light uh, to be light at once, to be ones who are sent and who can uh, see even more no matter how dark the circumstances we are trapped in, even for a long time, uh, we want to uh, be able to be sent by you so that we can go to where your authority is, your word that speaks that we come to you as the Siloa, uh, as the Shiloh. It comes to you as the one to whom we owe all our allegiance and our obedience and to whom we bring all the offerings of our love. And yes, Lord, we come to you to be your own sheep that you lay down your life for and that uh, we can ascend with you in this, uh, like Paul says, uh, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, put on the, the, the death 
and the dying of the Lord Jesus Christ, put on the crucified life, because that's our beckoning and that's our call, and that's where, Lord, we can truly, uh, we, we can truly speak with you from John 10, even within the midst of the temple of dedication, of the temple of holiness, even in, in the heavens, Lord, and where we can uh, be uh, uh, really um, one with you and with the Father, sharing your glory. Thank you. We bless your holy name. And in your holy name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. The Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance before you as you move uh, into the light of the Lord Jesus Christ, this Hanukkah and beyond, so that he from whom all blessings flow will bless you and be blessed now and always. Amen. Amen. All right, let us uh, say.